So I mentioned yesterday um, you know, this, this problem of um, Newtonian gravity and that it's action at a distance. Um, and you know, this was seen, so Newtonian gravity, you, know, you, you have this instantaneous action at a distance, a mass over here will influence a mass over here instantaneously. Um, and and there's, no, there's no contact between the two masses. Uh, it's just uh, some sort of uh, non-local action at a distance. And this was viewed as a problem at the time by Newton himself and no doubt many other people. Um, had there been ample funding and uh, um, air flight, there probably would have been many um, conferences um, all over the world were trying to resolve uh, this and come up with um, you know, a good interpretation of Newtonian gravity um, to, to, to understand this, this problem. So how did it actually get resolved? Um, well, it got resolved by um, considering this problem, this I'm calling it the problem of relativistic gravity. So uh, you know, by the time you get to um, the uh, you know, late 1800s, there were these two theories, uh, two types of theories. Suddenly by the time you get to 1905, uh, you had, um, well, still Newtonian gravity, uh, but then you also had uh, Einstein's theory of uh, special relativity, and in particular, there were field theories such as uh, electromagnetism, fluid dynamics, uh, which were uh, special relativistic field theories. And the problem was uh, uh, that these two things were inconsistent. It, it, uh, the, the, no one had a, a relativistic field theory, special relativistic field theory that would describe uh, Newtonian uh, gravity. Are you sure there was relativistic fluid dynamics? Yes, I'm not sure about that, yeah. yeah. And as I said it, it occurred to me, Sam is going to bring up this. <laughs> <laughs> there, there might indeed have been special relativistic field theory. There is no special relativistic field theory. Yeah. So it's a, it's a general set of field theories that you might consider. At the very least, there might have been the conception that electromagnetism wasn't the only possible yeah. field theory. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so that, that's the sort of problem uh, that people faced. Um, and... Um, Let's just see what do I say next. Oh yeah, okay. Um, and you know, the question is, how do you solve that? Well, the problem was solved by uh, Einstein, and um, the thing I'm calling here relativistic gravity got a name, came uh, general relativity. So general relativity is 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 uh, is uh, you can think of it as consisting of three different parts. First of all, there's a prescription. It's a prescription for converting. Special relativistic matter field equations, which are expressed in a global inertial reference frame, uh, into general relativistic matter field equations, which are now in a general inertial, a general reference frame. Uh, and to do that, you have to actually change the equations. You have to make the substitutions uh, I've indicated there. So you go from a, um, a general, so you go from a, a Minkowski metric to a general metric. You go from partial derivative to the covariant derivative. And you put all the variables, uh, you make all the, all the, all the coordinates, uh, general coordinates. Um, then there's an addendum. So if you look at those equations, now you've got, um, you used to have the um, Minkowski metric, which is constant, but now you have uh, an extra 10 real parameters in the, um, in the metric. And so if you had enough field equations originally to solve the problem, you no longer do. Now you have a 10, 10 extra field, 10 extra uh, uh, real fields. Uh, so you need 10 extra equations uh, to, to solve, and so um, this uh, means you need an addendum to that set of field equations, uh, and this is uh, the Einstein field equations, which Einstein got um, through you know, looking for something which is analogous to um, the Poisson equation, uh, uh, to the Newtonian gravity. So, so in a sense, what you have here is the first, the prescription changes, um, prescription changes the special relativistic field theories. Um, so you no longer have, you have to modify um, special relativistic field equations. And the addendum modifies Newtonian gravity because Einstein's uh, theory, oops, I don't have to, I'm just going to move Einstein's theory of, uh, Einstein's field equations uh, give you uh, the um, Newtonian gravity in the limits, but they're not actually the same, they're not uh, the same. So, it's interesting that in solving this problem, you had to do it in an even-handed way. You had to modify both Newtonian gravity and special uh, relativistic field equations. Okay. 
Uh, well, the other thing that you get is uh, an interpretation. Uh, and um, the observables, sorry, the beables, which people in the general relativity community often call observables, although I think that's the wrong name for them. So the things that are real, the, real, the ontologically real quantities uh, in the theory are those quantities that are invariant under general diff diffeomorphisms. So you have a solution, and you look at that solution, you want to know what of that solution is, is, um, is, is physically real, is, is, is a beable, then you have to find quantities for that solution which are invariant under general diffeomorphisms. Um, and this, this interpretation, uh, it's suggested by the formalism, it, it's uh, really there isn't, there isn't the same sort of disagreement about general relativity as there is about quantum theory. Pretty much everyone agrees that this is the correct interpretation. Uh, and it's an interpretation which is suggested uh, by the formalism, but it's still radical. It's, it's a very, it provide, if you really think about this, um, it does provide a very radical view of the world. Um, in particular, um, you might say, well, I can talk about, um, I want to talk about what's happening in a certain region of the manifold. You know, imagine I have a, a manifold. Yeah, I was expecting this to be a green pack. Um, <coughs> and then I'm interested in, in what, is, what is true in a, I was expecting this to be a green um, okay. Can I just put them there? Yeah. No, I missed it. No. Okay, you might ask, what, what is true in this region of the manifold? What, what are the beables pertaining to this part of the manifold? Well, uh, there aren't any beables pertaining to this region of the manifold because anything you try to say, anything you try to construct out of the fields that live here will be changed when you hit the solution with a, with a diffeomorphism because it will take these fields somewhere else and replace them with different fields. Uh, and so, um, and so um, there are no beables pertaining to certain regions of the manifold. So the sort of view of reality isn't that it's stuck on the manifold, it's, it's a sort of it's a more radical point of view, and uh, one could talk about that for a long time, but I, I don't want to get too sidetracked. Okay, so, um, so once we've got general relativity, then we can uh, take the limit as c goes to infinity, and you get this... Uh, thing called newton cartan gravity, which is, uh, gives you back Newtonian uh, gravity. This is of academic interest. Uh, very few physicists uh, care about newton, newton cartan gravity, or even, uh, even, even know about it, including myself. I have a student who's going to learn it and teach it to me next week, uh, so I'll be able to tell you more about it uh, then. Uh, however, it is in the limit in which you get back um, Newtonian um, gravity. Um, the question is, how did Einstein get to general relativity? Um, well, if you look at what it did, it was a very conceptually driven approach. Um, so, um, well, I'm not going to go through all this. There's six plus three steps. Yeah, there's three steps I'm not going to talk about at all. Um, but let me just talk about a few of these steps. So, um, you know, first of all, he starts off with this uh, equivalence principle. Um, you know, that an apple and a bigger apple will fall at the same uh, rate, um, uh, and then he deduces that there's no global inertial reference frame. From that he motivates that you should use um, general coordinates, that you can't use um, inertial uh, coordinates, um, and then you know, various you know, there's locality, I'm not going to talk about that, um, and then at the end you know, we have this principle of general covariance, well if you have to write your, your, your physics, your equations down uh, in general coordinates, um, how are you going to do that? Um, and uh, he says, well, let's, let's adopt this principle that the laws of physics should be written in such a way that first of all, they work in any coordinate system, and secondly, they take the same form in any coordinate system. And this was a very powerful uh, principle for him to get to the theory of, um, of general relativity. So it's a very conceptually uh, driven approach. Um, Okay, well now we're faced with the problem of um, quantum gravity. It's very similar to the problem of relativistic um, gravity that I talked about before. Uh, in this case, the problem of quantum gravity is to find a physical theory which, in appropriate limits, gives you back general relativity on the one hand and quantum theory, or maybe more particularly quantum field theory, uh, on the other hand. Um, the theory of quantum gravity itself may be a, a, you know, a deeper 
theory may look very different. The mathematics of quantum gravity may be as different from the mathematics of general relativity or quantum field theory as, for example, the mathematics of general relativity is from the mathematics of um, you know, Newton's formulation of, of his mechanics. Um, um, so that, that may be the case. It could also, of course, be the case that quantum gravity can be formulated entirely in terms of the concepts we have available in quantum theory. That's possibly in principle, although to me it seems unlikely. It seems to me that we need to do something which is even-handed. Just as in the case of relativistic gravity, we had to change both um, the special relativistic field equations side of things and also the gravity side of things. I think the same will be true here. Um, Okay, so if you look at current work on the interpretation of quantum theory, it doesn't look to me like it's geared up to solve the problem of quantum gravity. Um, rather, it looks to me like it's an attempt to guess the analog of the Newton-Cartan theory. It looks like we're just trying to guess from essentially nowhere what the interpretation is, um, uh, and so that we get you know uh, something which will be analogous to Newton-Cartan theory. Of course. Um, we don't know that any of the interpretations we have are the analog of Newton-Cartan theory. We don't know that when we have a theory of quantum gravity, it will limit uh, uh, to uh, one of the interpretations that we, we have. And so I would say that the problem of quantum gravity is too important to be left to the string and uh, loop people. Um, and uh, in particular, it's something that um, this kind of community of people, uh, I think, should take on. Um, whilst I'm critical in the first sentence on that slide of work that's been done on interpretation, um, on the other hand, I think it's driven by very noble instincts. Um, and uh, I think the, 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 the right instincts, incidentally, uh, to, to make progress in physics. I think we need to um, harness these um, noble instincts um, uh, so sort of conceptually driven instincts uh, to solve the problem of uh, quantum gravity. Okay. So that motivates this. <coughs> this is the construction interpretation. Uh, the construction interpretation is why well, there's five tenets of the construction interpretation. Here they are, four here, one more on the next slide. Um, so the construction inter interpretation is driven by the intent to construct a theory of quantum gravity. Uh, as such, it's opportunistic uh, in that it will adopt and abandon ideas uh, as serves this goal. The construction interpretation is uh, conceptual, so it should repurpose concepts and principles taken from the foundations of quantum theory and also foundations of general relativity for the primary purpose of theory construction. The construction interpretation is ontological, is operational and ontological. So both operational and ontological methodologies are are, compete, are valid uh, from this point of view um, uh, in in this drive to find a theory of uh, quantum gravity. Also, um, in this interpretation, um, we um, we adopt the use of frameworks and principles. You know, if you look at what Einstein did, he adopted, we came to this framework of having tensor fields on a manifold, um, uh, and likewise we need to find you know, what, what are good frameworks uh, in which to uh, make progress on this. And these frameworks could be operational and or ontological. Um, and then once you have those frameworks, you can use them as a place to attempt to impose uh, conceptual ideas and, and principles such as Einstein did with the equivalence principle. Um, and then the most important thing about the conceptual interpretation is that it's not an interpretation. Uh, the construction interpretation is not actually an interpretation, but rather it's a methodology uh, aimed at finding a theory of quantum gravity. So as such, it's uh, completely pluralistic. It, it, sort of, it uh, encourages uh, many different uh, conceptually different approaches. Uh, the main thing is that it does encourage people to uh, attempt to solve the problem of quantum gravity uh, in this way, in this conceptual uh, manner. Um, ah. So my hope, uh, although this may turn out to be uh, in vain, is that um, 
is that uh, once we have a theory of quantum gravity, it will suggest its own interpretation, uh, just like uh, was the case in, um, <coughs> in general relativity. But that may turn out not to be the case, of course. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so and, and now, now the next part of the talk will just be some of my thoughts along these um, lines. But of course, the construction interpretation is pluralistic, so any, anything of this sort, any, any attempt to get to grips with, um, with quantum gravity um, along these lines, I think, is, is, is very much to be uh, encouraged. So, for example, the recent uh, work that, that you guys did on, um, on showing that the sum the central quantum effect in the, in the gravitational field, this uh, argument of superpositions of masses in different uh, positions, I think is, is exactly the sort of uh, research I think we need to uh, engage in uh, to, to get some traction on the problem. Um, okay. Um, so, so the first thought is, is, um, is to look at the two less fundamental theories of general relativity on the one hand and quantum theory uh, on the other hand and um, so notice that they have uh, in some sense complementary conservative and radical uh, features so, so general relativity uh, well first of all it's conservative in the sense that it's a deterministic theory If you give sufficient boundary information, then you can determine um, exactly what the, the physical content is of the solution. Uh, on the other hand, it's radical in that the causal structure, which is determined by the metric in general relativity, is something that's dynamical. You solve for the causal structure, you don't give it uh, in advance. Um, quantum theory on the other hand, is conservative in that it has fixed causal structure. You have to give the causal structure up front uh, in the way you formulate quantum theory. Uh, in fact, this is really built into the, um, to the, um, to the framework. Okay, this is a blueprint. Um, um, so one, one way to see that is that you, you know, typical interpretations of a, you, you evolve a, a wave function in time. And so you, you know, that, that, so you can see there that the, the causal structure is built in. Maybe another way to think about this is um, perhaps more interesting. So consider um, two qubits. We pass through a sequence of gates. So here's some gates. Um, and um, the question is, what is the appropriate mathematical object associated with various pairs of these gates? So let me take the gates A and B. Well, then the appropriate mathematical object is, uh, is some kind of tensor product of uh, appropriate operators. So the way you would combine, well, I'm not going to go into details, but the appropriate mathematical object here would be some tensor product. Um, what about B and C? In that case, the appropriate mathematical object is going to be some direct product of operators. Okay, so because they're sequential. What about the case um, B and D? And D. In that case, you can define something. Uh, I'm going to call it the the question mark product. So this question mark product is defined. It's a linear operator that's defined to have the property that if it acts on an intermediate operator, it gives you B C D. Okay, I should have put those letters the way around. It should have been. Okay, so are these there. unitaries? Or? These could be um, super operators. Super okay. Yeah, so, so unitaries would be way yes. over yes. yeah. That, that's the real what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, well, they could be Krauss operators, in which case the unitary operator is an example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so in this case, the appropriate. So this, this is the appropriate way of combining operators here because this acts on C to give C D D C B. And this is a this is a linear um, operator. That's perfectly well uh, defined if you think about it carefully. But you can see now that each of these 
different causal situations, you have a different way of combining the operators. Three different causal situations, and in each of them you define. So you have to give the causal structure up front so that you know what way you should go about combining uh, the operators. So really, the causal structure is built in from the beginning, it has to be. On the other hand, um, quantum theory has a radical property um, that it has this sort of in inherent probabilis uh, probability. You, you can't write down the rules of the standard rules of quantum theory without referring to uh, probability. Um, or a different way of saying it is you have a sort of fundamental indefiniteness. Uh, I mean, I know there, there are uh, different interpretations put different uh, slants on these kinds of questions. Like in the Jacobi Bohm model, there is actually you know, fundamental determinism. Um, but nevertheless, there's something there that you have, you know, a particle can go one way or the other, there's some sense in which something goes both ways. Um, how do you want to interpret that? So, and so, ever? Yeah, indeed, ever. You would have some sort of indefiniteness. I mean, in the sense that you would have a, a, a weight on two branches. Um, Branches itself are constant, it's not physics. Okay, well, then let's not talk about everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I should have to mention branches. I did promise myself the only branches would be the ones in the photograph at the beginning. Um, okay. So, so, we expect a theory of quantum gravity to take the radical route in each case. It doesn't have to be like that. It could be that you take some way of taking the conservative approaches or the conservative approach to GR and the, and the radical approach to quantum well, theory could be that something like this is possible. But, um, um, but um, it seems to me, in some sense, the least radical suggestion is that you take the most radical route in each case. You know, if, if, if quantum theory brings something new to the table, it's unlikely that uh, quantum gravity will take that away, and likewise uh, with general relativity. Um, so it seems to me that uh, we expect to have um, indefinite causal structure. So something like uh, there will be no matter of the fact as to whether some separation is time-like or space-like, or indeed whether a sudden causal ordering is this way or, or, or this way. Um, if we have that, uh, then there's a problem in defining, um, uh, you know, sort of foliation. We can't have, you know, usually a foliation you have um, these, these points are separated, nearby points are separated on a, on a, on a, on a foliation surface by a space-like um, uh, distance. Uh, and if we have indefinite causal structure, then we don't have that concept available to us. Um, so we, we can't do physics in terms of the evolution, the time evolution of a state. Of a global state. Of a global state, yeah. yeah. Well, even locally, why, why, why do you emphasize the word global? Well, because locally you could have uh, time evolution without a definite causal structure. I think, I think, I think maybe you're thinking about closed time like loops. Well, uh, that's well, uh, example, yeah. Whereas I'm, I'm thinking more about sort of local indefinite causal structure that, that uh, in, oh, in, in the vicinity of some I see. point. I see. Arbitrarily yeah, close. Yeah, arbitrarily yeah. close. But something maybe at the scale of the planet okay. scale it would be there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Suddenly, then, in the case of closed time like loops, you could have local, locally definite yeah, causal well, structure. But, so, um, yeah, but these are two different sorts. A, a different... A, Different guess, but yeah. I think without you, you could do without um, global causal structure while still having an infinitesimal causal structure. Right. Yeah. But so because if you have sort of superposition of different metrics, sort of in the vicinity of some point, whatever that means, yes, then it looks like you have locally indefinite causal structure, and so then that option isn't isn't available. Um, well, yeah. yeah. Listen, I think. I understand that you resist uh, Barber's route to shape dynamics, mm -hmm. but if you do take that route, mm -hmm. um, what do you say there about causal structure? I mean, here um, now you've got. I mean, I'm not I'm not sufficiently familiar with it. I mean, um, you know, from, from my own point of view, what I wanted to do was to get to grips with how to do um, physics in, in this way. Yeah. You know, but I, I think anything like that is completely valid. I mean, the point I was making earlier is that I'd really like to see this. Well, difference. I just wondered whether. Indefinite causal structure is consistent with um, mm -hmm. foliation in, where you do have a, a, a determinate foliation. Um. <coughs> Sorry, I don't understand. You have a preferred foliation. Yeah. And you, you swap this foliation uh, independence for, uh, for, for uh, scale invariance. Okay. Uh, I, I just wonder. Yeah, I mean, there may be some way of, of, of doing it. Um, I mean, as I was saying, this is. 
this is the option where you take the radical route in each case. Yeah. And, and there may be some way of doing it where actually you can take the conservative approach on one of the two arms. Um, uh -huh. Just as within quantum theory, actually, you know, there are interpretations which are deterministic, even though it's like yeah. indefiniteness. I mean, I mean, the, the worry is that dynamic causal structure in your sense mm -hmm. can't be central to GR if you can swap foliation and refoliation uh, um, at full scale. That's the I think, um, as an operational level, there is definitely something like dynamic causal structure. If you attempt to define operationally one, you know, some event, such as by the intersection of two uh, fluid blobs, and, and you attempt to do the same for a number of events, then whether the separation between those, <coughs> those operationally defined events is space that time like is dynamically determined by other things you might determine. Um, so, at an operational level, it's certainly true that you have this sort of um, uh, dynamical causal structure. Now, it might be that there does exist some fundamental, some, some different formulation where, where, where fundamentally that, that vanishes. Um, you know, but, but this is, I mean, as, as I was saying earlier, this is, you know, I think we need to be opportunistic. We try some idea, we see how far it goes. Um, there's, there's, um, I mean, it's something, Einstein's, Einstein's motivation for GR is, is, is very natural if, if you take the point of view that uh, causal structure is dynamical. Mm. It may be that you can find a different formulation which, um, which um, doesn't have that property, but um, there's a very strong naturalness argument for it. I mean, the contrast with quantum mechanics is, is rather striking, isn't it? Um, that there's no reformulation of quantum mechanics that eradicates the supposedly radical aspect of it. Well, except something you might argue that, that the boy bone model does in the sense that it at least makes it... Well, I think that is a different theory from regular quantum mechanics, right. and what's happening with straight dynamics is not that. Right. I mean, but it could be the route to quantum gravity is actually through the de Bruyne model. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, that in quantum <coughs> gravity you might, you might start to see, you know, Anthony's, Anthony Valentini's um, non-inclusive dynamics. So um, it's certainly, it's a possible route. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, I think all these different approaches should be you know, tackled by mm -hmm. different people. It seems to me an interesting challenge to try and find, think of a way to do physics where you don't have definite causal structure. Um, you know, because we're so reliant on this concept of evolving a state in time. Uh, and indeed, you can do physics without relying on definite causal structure. Uh, so I think that, that's, uh, you know, that's a possible approach. Um, okay. Okay, so... Um, so if one is going to do physics um, without definite causal structure, uh, how, how are we going to proceed? Well, you still, you know, if, if you have no notion of how to separate, you know, um, stuff that's happening, then essentially everything is just happening at one point, and you, you can't really do physics. You need some way to, to, to talk, to address different bits of the world in some sense. And typically we're used to using... Um, space and time in, 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 the, in the sort of standard sense where you have definite space and definite time uh, to do that. Um, but uh, maybe we can proceed in a, in a, in a different way. And, um, and um, so we need some sort of something that will replace uh, space and time in that usual way. Uh, and the idea is, is to define some sort, of, some sort of some space in which you can compose the world. So you break the world up into different pieces and then you can um, you can consider small pieces of the world and compose them. And so one idea is to use um, sort of variables on your axes. So you have <coughs> some number of variables. So variable one. So a bunch of, uh, of uh, properties in your theory. And, um, and, and maybe there's more than three. Maybe there's you know, 100 properties, whatever. And they define some space, and then you can talk about what happens or what might happen in different regions of, of this um, this um, compositional space. Okay, and a particular choice of variable that that might be useful would be one that corresponds to stuff we actually see. So this would be a sort of operational, so things that are operationally accessible. So that would then give you. So this is the more general concept of compositional space. 
um, but we could also have um, a particular application of this would be where the viewables are things that we suppose we can see directly. And that would be operational. Space. Um, so, um, I wonder, oh, let's see how much time is there. I want, so I wrote a paper a couple of years ago where I reformulate classical general relativity in operational terms. Uh, and in that case, the, um, the viewables that I use uh, uh, on the axes, uh, which I'm, I'm claiming to find in this case, in, in that case, an operational space, are certain scalar quantities that you could imagine measuring. You know, in general relativity, you have tensor fields, but you can construct um, uh, construct uh, like the scalar quantities by forming quantities which where you sum over all the instances. Um, in that case, you'd have um, a space defined by um, a certain set of uh, scales. So that's one way of um, setting up uh, an operational uh, space. Uh, and in that case, your observations would be things like, well, scalar one has the value, a certain value S1. This is going to be a general point. So, Scalar 1 has a certain value, S1. Scalar 2 has a certain value. Scalar 3 has a certain value. So you have these point coincidences in the values of scales. Uh, and, and that's a route to setting up a sort of operational um, formulation of, um, of general relativity. And you could attempt to do something uh, similar in, in, in the quantum gravity case. So define some set of uh, vehicles that correspond to the things we directly observe and use those to define um, a certain space. Um, so in, in this space, this operational space or compositional space more generally, uh, it isn't necessarily the case that um, you know, between two points there is a well-defined causal structure. Um, uh, because in, in, you know, that may depend on other stuff that's happening, and in selecting a subset of possible vehicles, you haven't necessarily given enough information to say that the causal structure between them is, is space-like or time-like. Uh, and indeed, if you're in the context of quantum gravity, there may be no matter of the fact as to whether the separation is space-like or not time -like. Is that is that clear? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Um, so this motivates uh, the following uh, idea. Um, Call it formalism of locality. I feel like this needs a more exciting name um, because I've written lots of papers about it and nobody gets very excited. Um, 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 but I think it's, an, I think it's a, an interesting idea. So imagine in this operational space, or this, this compositional space, we have some region. Okay. Some region here. Okay. Uh, and now I want to make um, predictions. Um, that pertain uh, to this um, to this region. Okay. Um, so maybe I should give an example. Let me just give a, a side example of it here. Let's just take um, even special relativity. Imagine I have now. This is an odd shaped region on on, on in uh, a space time. Okay. So this is not compositional space, but space time. Okay. And I want to make a prediction pertaining to this um, region. Well, it's kind of difficult because um, because there could be influences coming into this region. I'm not sure to give the best example. Let me let me give a different example of the region. Okay, there could be influences coming into this region um, from outside um, that, that affect any attempt I make to try to make a prediction. So. You know, I, I'm trying to make a prediction pertaining to this region, um, but uh, what happens inside this region is influenced by stuff that happens uh, outside the region. Um, well, one way to proceed is to embed this region inside a, a sort of causal, a causally bounded uh, region like this. Okay, just ignore that. Um, so here's a, here's a, a sort of a, a causally bounded region. Over here, I can write down some initial state, and then I can evolve this initial state through here 
Uh, and there's no way for external influences to get into this. So all, so everything that I can say about here can be deduced from this initial state. So that's the way I can make uh, predictions for an odd-shaped region. Um, okay, and that, that's how you would normally think of doing this. We sort of, we, we, we use causal, causal concepts to say what we can and can't predict and how we, how we go about making predictions. Um, the problem is that over here, when we have indefinite causal structure, this isn't open to us. We can't write down the state on some initial, you know, um, space-like hypersurface and use that to tell us what's going to happen <coughs> inside that region. It's just not a, an option. Uh, and indeed, in, if you have indefinite causal structure, there, there aren't really any special shapes that we can embed this inside of. Um, so we'd better just, uh, this, 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 this region of uh, compositional space, we better be able to fend for itself. So we'd better be able to make predictions pertaining to this region of composition, this, this region here, uh, just using mathematical objects that pertain to this region. But there better be regions with that property. Which property? Mm -hmm. That you can make? Yes, n not necessarily every region. Well, um, so this, this, is, this, is where it, this, is, this is where the, the trick is going to come in. So I, we saw a region where it was a problem because you have external right. influences coming in. And if you have indefinite causal the structure, it starts to look like everything is of that nature. Um, but he, here's the strategy, um, is that um, you have a, a two-stage calculation. So step one is where you do um, what I call prediction heralding. Um, so prediction heralding is where you have some mathematical calculation that you can do that tells you whether or not you can predict, make a prediction. So it could be a prediction for probability. Okay. Uh, and it may be in this region some quantities can be predicted in that way and some can't. Okay. But it, it's, the, the essential thing is that you don't have to refer to this kind of tradecraft where you refer to different, you know, to the causal structure in the background, but instead you have a mathematical procedure that tells you um, what you can and what you can't predict. Um, and um, just bring in this other board over here. I think there's a phenomenon where when you're giving a talk it becomes very difficult to, to uh, complete basic uh, mechanical tasks. <laughs> there, okay. So, um, Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the, the, the formalism. Um, so imagine you have some region like that, and you're interested in a prediction that concerns whether or not you see um, some set of outcomes, let's call them A, or some set of outcomes A prime, given some set of settings, um, let's just call them A, let's say. So you have some set of uh, settings inside this region, various knobs that you can adjust. Uh, and then you're interested in some property, you know, whether you have uh, outcomes A or outcomes A prime. Uh, so what you might be interested in is the relative probability for seeing outcomes A versus outcomes A prime. And we just call it the relative probability. Okay. Um, well, in the formalism I, I developed in 2005, it's called the causaloid framework. I'm not going to go into the details, just bring out the essential uh, property here. There is associated with any pair, like OA and SA for a certain region A, this is region A, there is associated with that a vector. And likewise, associated with OA prime, SA, there's another vector. Okay. The, um, the prediction heralding um, uh, that's required in step one inside this framework uh, is where you check to see if these two vectors are parallel 
or not parallel. If these two vectors are parallel, then you can proceed on to step two. And step two is, um, is where you then actually calculate the probability. And in this case, the probability is given by the, the, um, the, the, the ratio of the, of the um, lengths of these, of these vectors. So again, the ratio of the lengths of these projectors is P, and that's the probability that you want. So it's a two-stage calculation. The first stage is, is where you have an actual calculation, not referring, you know, you don't have to sort of investigate by hand the causal structure and decide if this is a situation where you can say something or where you can't. You just do a calculation. Um, I think, you know, in physics it's always good when you can remove tradecraft and substitute in um, uh, calculation. Um, and then the second thing is, if you can make a prediction, then you have, um, if, if these two vectors are parallel, then you have a way of actually getting the prediction. Incidentally, because often people that worry about this and say, well, generically these two vectors are not going to be parallel. If, if they're almost parallel, then you can put some bounds on this probability. Um, but the less, parallel, the less parallel they are, the easier it is for some adversary to mess up your prediction. You can imagine some guy outside who's trying to mess up what predictions you make and um, and it's easier for, for him to do that if these vectors are not parallel. Um, so so this this point of view um, I think is, um, is is a is a different kind of point of view. In some sense it's demanded once you have indefinite causal structure you really don't have much choice. You've kind of got to go down this route. Um, because you don't know, you have no, there's no special shapes. Uh, how are you going to make predictions? Well, you can't just give up on physics or, or do the best you can. Um, and um, so this is, this is sort of doing the best you can. And in some sense, that's, that's all you can demand. Um, and in some ways, it's sort of, there was some discussion yesterday about um, you know, why determinism is preferred, because then you have an explanation for everything. Uh, you know, you have determinism over here. But everything is determined. Then you have, imagine here you have uh, what people think, you know, people normally, people, the uh, probabilistic theories are regarded as being, you know, you have less explanation because for some things you have to give probabilities. You know, these, but over here, actually you have something even more radical, which is where a lot of stuff you can't even make a probabilistic prediction. Um, um, so you have this progression of, of, of sort of radical ideas. And so over here, you have to just do the best you can. Um, uh, and um, if that's all that physics furnishes with you with, then that's all you need to discover. Okay. Any questions on that? So I guess this, so this is the part of the talk that's most relevant to this, this um, workshop, because it's about, um, about probability. And I think there's a, an even deeper uh, you know, an even deeper problem than, than, than probabilities, which is you just can't even make predictions. And, and that's actually the generic situation. Suddenly if you consider, you know, like if I consider, you know, what's the probability if I drop this, um, this, this pen um, um, uh, right now, um, the, the British prime, prime Minister will have to resign uh, next week. Well, um, it's not really a, a question that you, you can answer. There's too many other uh, things that that's conditioned on. Um, try anyway. Sorry? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping yes. that uh, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping that um, she'll feel a sudden rush of wind to her. Then maybe do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so, 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 so a lot of so basically generic questions you simply can't. Um, you simply don't have predictions for them, or even in the context of you know something more uh, prosaic like a, a quantum circuit. Um, if I have some, you know some quantum circuit, okay, and I ask myself, what's the probability if, if I if I if I see a certain outcome here, or see a, a certain outcome here? 
Well, that also isn't well defined because some stuff that's going on here. Um, and, um, and so generically, if you just consider things of the nature of probability of A given B, um, generically that thing is not going to be um, well, you could put it, it's not going to be well, well conditioned. Because you haven't given sufficient conditions here to be able to make a probability. What this argument does is, is make you see, well, this, is, this actually may be the fundamental situation. Because if you have indefinite causal structure, you just generically cannot do that. And so, um, so then you have to face up to this as a part of your physics, and, and, um, and then you need something like this two step approach. Um, I mean, Mr. Nathan's first, this is a bit about probability. I mean, could you just give it a flip of that? Yeah, I mean, you, you've given a very thin notion of probability. You won't. Why is rho even bounded by zero and one? Why is what, sorry? Why is rho even or rho P, is, P, is P, 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 yeah. Why is it even bounded by zero and one? Oh, actually, it isn't, because it's, this is a relative probability. This is the ratio of two probabilities. Uh -huh. Yeah. This is. Um, is there any further calculus probabilities that you can get out of this in a natural way? So, I mean, you can, you can, do, you can do all the quantum theory in this framework. So, all the standard uh, results of quantum theory where you do have definite causal structure can be put into this framework, and I showed how to do that in this um, 2005 paper. So it's at least as good as the standard uh, calculus. I mean, I mean, you're not giving a sense of, of how this is a natural framework. I mean, I understand, okay, mm. in the specific case of quantum theory, then yeah. you've got, but just in the rather abstract structure that you've set out, mm. how is this a probability space? In what sense is this a measure? In what sense are conditional probabilities defined? And, and so on and so forth. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I think, I think to answer those questions, I'm then going to have to sort of, you know, present the, right, the causal right. framework in full, and uh, I, I don't okay. have time for that. I just wanted to bring out this particular right. aspect of it. Right. I mean, it's not, it's not, I'm not changing, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, radical that's happening really, in so as far as probably is, is concerned other than this. But suddenly, um, I think you can, all the concepts you just mentioned, you, you can have those in some sense. Um, right. Um, I, 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 in your formalism, is probability going to have a meaning? Is it going to uh, obey the probability calculus and all that stuff? That was, right. That's my question. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think the answer is, is, is yes. Like well, I mean, okay. Just, I mean, there's a. I mean, by hand or? or no? Yeah. There is, okay. There, there is there is a there is a question here. I'm not answering your question properly. Um, and um, and um, and I think it's sort of that I'm, at some level I'm cheating. Uh, and the way I get this framework is I consider. You know, I consider all of my you know, my big operational space, uh, and then I, I, I wish to get this formalism. I restrict to some still very big part of the operational space, and I imagine out here there are some conditions such that now probabilities inside here are well are are all given, okay, and those those probabilities satisfy all the all the requirements you have. Then once I'm inside here, I now consider different regions, and what I can say you know here and here. Um, and you know the, the sort of question I'm asking here, I could ask that of some smaller region inside this space, say that region. Um, and, and now I have to go to this form, this framework. Um, now, in the background, in the way I set the framework up, I did actually have these well-conditioned probabilities over the the entire sort of universe, so to speak. However, uh, you could make a final step and say, well, that was just some scaffolding you had to erect to get the mathematical framework. Fundamentally, maybe you shouldn't think in those terms and just think of these things as being fundamental. So, but why should you want that? If you have a, a theory with a conventional causal structure, then you could kind of define time mm -hmm. as being like the set of all places such that probabilities add up to one. Right. Probabilities at different times don't have to add up to one and don't have to add. We I mean, probably start to add up to one over a sort of mutually exclusive set of possibilities, whether those are delocalized in time or not. Well, yes, but in particular, over time. Um, yeah, but if we don't have time, then you'll be confident. Yes. yes. Yeah. So why would you expect probabilities to add up to one in general in your framework? Well, over, if you consider, you know, overall this, this whole region, uh, then, then, then you consider <laughs> different outcomes that can happen, then they will add up to one, just because I'm, I'm not being radical. D because different mutually exclusive outcomes. Yeah, exactly, but, yeah. but mutually exclusive is, is usually means mutually exclusive at the same time. It doesn't. No, it doesn't have to mean that at all. I think. I think it's not the case in, say, just common law of um, probability theory. You can. Um, you can talk about well, um, at the same state of knowledge. It is a very simple experiment, just within quantum theory. 
where I have this, this is a preparation device that has a light on it that flashes red or blue, or black or black. And here's, here's another similar one. Okay. Uh, and so, so I can consider, you know, there's all these pairs, red, red, all the way through to blue, blue. The probabilities over, if I add the probabilities over these four different yes. cases, then I get one. one. Yes. But these are delocalizing time. These are, these are, um, it's so not at a given time. Okay. Not for me yeah. <laughs> um, Okay. Uh, let me just see. Yeah. So just um, so here, so formulation. So of course, the physical theory may be formulated in lots of different ways, um, but perhaps you can, in particular, you can formulate it in such a way that it has this um, property that you can make predictions uh, in a region uh, only using map particle objects that pertain to that region. And so the map particle objects, I call those generalized states. So these R vectors would be the generalized states in this particular case. Uh, and you can find a similar thing in, in say, standard quantum theory. You can also do it in, in, um, in, in, in general relativity. You can have a, a probabilistic version of general relativity in operational kind of understanding of GR. So you can do that there too. Um, okay, so that's the idea of the that does. Um, okay. There's, there's one more um, thing I want to discuss. Um, and um, I think you remember the, the, general, the, the, the principle of general covariance, um, which says that you can formulate the laws of physics in any uh, uh, any um, coordinate system, and in such a way that they have the same form in any, in any coordinate system. And uh, well, it seems to me that it would be good to have a principle like that that, that would pertain to, to this kind of situation. Um, so, let's talk about this a bit. Um, imagine now in this uh, operational space you have some composite object, okay? So you have um, various regions um, that are um, that um, of the compositional space. You could expand that, or you could write that down schematically, like as a as a, a sort of graph. This is maybe not the most interesting graph. Um, and this this graph is the kind of is the compositional description of this object. Okay. Um, and um, now you might ask, well, how do I do a calculation um, uh, for this object? I want to calculate, say, the generalized state. If I have the generalized state of this object, then I can tell you which probabilities are are well conditioned and um, and what they are equal to. Okay. So how do I go about calculating the, um, the generalized state um, for, uh, uh, associated with some composite object uh, like this? Um, but I don't have any background causal structure that I can use to tell me how to do that calculation. You know, like in quantum theory earlier when we talked about combining these operators, I had some background causal structure that told me, well, this is the tensor product, this is the direct product, and so on. Um, I don't have that um, background causal structure it's analogous to, um, to um, the situation um, in uh, going from special to general. If you have general coordinates, then there's no special global coordinate system. Uh, so the motivation for the principle of general covariance is if there's no special coordinate system, no special global coordinate system, then you better formulate your laws of physics in such a way that they look the same in any coordinate system. Uh, so here, the idea is that the, um, the laws of physics should be written in such a way that they first of all work for any decomposition, because I could take this same bigger region and cut it into smaller regions in different ways. Uh, and secondly, I want the calculation to have the same compositional structure as the compositional structure uh, in, in the description of the object. Um,
this, this kind of addresses the, the question that came up um, yesterday in, in was this morning in, in your talk. Was that yesterday or this morning? This morning. Okay. Okay. Like a long time ago. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, how do you how do you put probability theory on top of um, of um, your space time structure? Um, it seems like an important question. Um, so if you have some structure. In this context, the structure is a sort of a compositional structure. Um, how do you put your probability theory on top of it? Because clearly, this probability theory has to talk to the, the structure that, uh, that it lives on top of. And what, what's the right way to think about that problem? Um, so the assertion here is that the way you do it is so that the, um, the calculations that you perform in, in the probability theory have the same compositional um, structure as the as the um, as the operational description of that compositional structure, uh, and you can do this uh, in quantum theory, for example. Um, you can write down a formulation for, say, quantum circuits, where the calculation for a quantum circuit has exactly the same compositional structure as the um, as as the operational description or the compositional description of that circuit. Uh, and you use, you use to do this, you use um, sort of certain tensorial uh, objects. Um, so let me just... Let me... So when, when you say compositional structure, yeah. what, what I'm seeing on the page there is, is a graph yeah. by the look of it. Is that how I should understand it? In yeah, general? yeah, I think you should understand it as a graph, yes. Okay, and then, and then there'll be tensors combining the, the respect... That the same, that's structure. the same way, yeah, yeah. There, there is incidentally a, a choice being made here. Uh, so I'm describing this object and I've only chosen in my description to, to put a, 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 a line on the immediately adjacent objects. I could have said, well, actually, I should put a line on some other properties of this, like if they're a certain you know, distance away in some sense. So there is, there is a choice. It's not as if the compositional description is, is completely uh, a neutral choice that you make. And it's, it's reminiscent of uh, the fact in, in general relativity that you, you make a choice to use uh, tensors on, on defined on tangent spaces, you know, that you could imagine setting up um, more general sorts of um, uh, local objects in, in GR. Um, so, likewise, here you do make, you actually are making a choice, uh, and then within that choice, um, you, you want to have this, this structure. Um, yeah, so, this is a way that your probability theory talks to some other structure in your in your theory. Um, and when you have indefinite causal structure, it, it seems like you don't have a lot of choice because um, if your probability theory isn't using this compositional structure to do calculations, then what structure is it using? There isn't a background um, causal structure that you can refer your calculations to. Unlike in the case um, over here, is it here? Yeah. Unlike in this case, there is a background causal structure, so you can refer your calculations to this background causal structure, so you have different objects in each case. Over here, there isn't that. So you sort of don't have a lot of choice. Just like in general relativity, you don't have much choice uh, other than to make the uh, equations take the same form in all frames of reference. Um, so if, if I wanted to make this look like quantum theory, you mentioned quantum theory as a special case. Yeah. What I do at this point, do I start putting Hilbert spaces on edges or something like that? Yeah, this? yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can do it in such a way that... Um, um, let me just have some slides on that. Sorry, last slide here. Um, okay, this is a different talk, but I can hear the slides. No, I don't have the slides. Okay. Um, well, something like this anyway. Um, so, this will be a way of formulating quantum field theory. We have different regions of space-time, uh, and then associated with each of those regions is a um, an operator, um, and, um, and and that operator lives on a Hilbert space, which is defined by the, the sort of boundary to that region, and then um, you can set things up so that um, the, the the calculation of the generalized state for this region, which is also an operator, is given um, by that. Um, that calculation I draw there is sort of Penrose style computation for the calculation.